Hello, my name's Adrian Goldberg and welcome to the Byline Times podcast. The Byline Times, it's what the papers don't say, what radio doesn't report and what telly doesn't tell you. This time a stark warning that fuel poverty at a time of escalating energy prices will lead to a humanitarian crisis in the UK. Thousands of lives will be lost and the development of millions of children blighted. That's the verdict of Professor Sir Michael Marmot from UCL in London with Professor Ian Sinha from the Alderhay Children's Hospital in Liverpool. We'll hear shortly from Sir Michael, whose original Marmot review in 2010 commissioned by Gordon Brown's Labour government, highlighted the north-south gap in health. A follow-up report a decade later showed the situation was getting worse, and that was before this latest crisis triggered by the war in Ukraine. First, though, just a reminder that the Byline Times podcast is funded by subscriptions to the Byline Times, our brilliant monthly newspaper edited by Hadeep Matharu. We can report without fear or favour and hold the rich and powerful to account, because our funding comes from ordinary subscribers, people like you. There is no corporate interest or millionaire backer telling us what to say. So please subscribe, if you can, to Byline Times. You get more details at bylinetimes.com. That's at bylinetimes.com. And if you have already subscribed, thank you. Let's hear then from Professor Sir Michael Marmot from University College London, one of the UK's foremost researchers into health inequality. Apologies in advance for the sound quality, by the way, at the start of this recording, but I hope you'll agree that the content of what Professor Sir Michael Marmot has to say is well worth listening to all the same. I asked him first, what is fuel poverty? Fuel poverty used to be defined simply as having to spend 10% of your household income, 10% or more of your household income, to heat your house to an acceptable level. In England, they made the definition a bit more complicated. It now has three components. The first is the housing quality, van D or below. Second is the price of fuel. And third is your income. And if you have to spend so much on fuel that you fall below the poverty line, then you're in fuel poverty. And one of the key insights of your research is that even before the massive rise in energy prices that we're seeing and which are forecast to continue perhaps for many years to come, is that many, many people were struggling to heat their homes thousands of people were already dying from the cold. We produced our first report on fuel poverty in 2014, and we already documented then that excess winter deaths in the UK are higher than in colder countries. And at least 10% of those excess winter deaths, which are around 60, 63,000 deaths a year, at least 10% of those can be attributed to cold homes. And we think that the reason excess winter deaths are higher in the UK than, for example, in Finland, is that our homes are colder because they're less well insulated. So that's been going on for a long time. Yeah, it's astonishing to think, isn't it, that more people die of the cold in this country than they do in a much colder country like Finland. And you trace that directly to the quality of insulation in British homes. Exactly right. And any Scandinavian will say to you, there's no such thing as cold, there's only poor clothing. We could apply the same to housing. It's not cold homes that's the problem. It's inadequate insulation and, of course, the price of energy and your ability to pay for it. Mm. This is important, though, isn't it, politically, because it's not enough to simply point the finger at the war in Ukraine and blame that for the energy crisis. This is a problem that predates the current crisis, albeit that the, this crisis will make it worse. This is something that has been problematic for many years. Well, let's look at the three components. Firstly, housing quality. The government stopped investing 
in-home insulation in 2013. The number of homes per year that were being insulated fell off a cliff in 2013. The government stopped doing it. It should have been a high priority. Just think ahead. Think ahead of the danger of running out of fuel or being able to have to go without because of cost. Insulate houses. And the government stopped doing it. Get rid of the green crap, said Prime Minister David Cameron. So our houses are substandard. They have been for a long time. There was an initiative to improve it, but that stopped around 2013. Secondly, poverty, the second component. The level of poverty increased over the decade of austerity. Incomes, average incomes, didn't do much. In fact, the incomes of employed people between 2007 and 2019 fell in the UK. We had the worst performance apart from Portugal and Greece of incomes over that period of any rich country. So we were doing pretty poorly and inequalities increased. So there was a rise in poverty. And then the third component is the price of fuel. Why has the price of fuel gone up more in the UK than it has in other European countries? The war in Ukraine and the problem with gas coming out of Russia affects all European countries. We have this dysfunctional energy market. It used to be the case, the green energy producers produced energy at higher cost than oil and gas. And so they were subsidized. Now, with the rise in oil and gas prices, green energy is cheaper. But we're still paying the market price, which is way above the price that would be paying if it was just production cost plus reasonable profit. We're paying way above that because of our dysfunctional energy market, which is a result of a botched privatization. So all three components, house quality, poverty, and the way energy prices are determined are dysfunctional and have been going on for a long time before we get this rapid increase in cost. Yes, and poverty, we've spoken before on this podcast about health inequality and your second Marmot Review in 2020 revealed this. Inequality was worsening between North and South and you attributed that directly to the policies of austerity. I did, and what we see is two interesting phenomena when we look at the North-South differences. Firstly, if we classify people by degree of deprivation, of the area in which they live, what you see is the more deprived the area, the shorter the life expectancy. But that gradient, as I call it, is steeper in the northeast and the northwest than it is in London and the south. In other words, the consequences of a given degree of deprivation for your health are bigger in the north than the south. If you're rich, it doesn't much matter where you live. If you're poor, it matters enormously. The disadvantage of being in the North is much bigger in terms of health for people in the more deprived areas than it is in the South. Do we know why that is? Well, let let me just say the other important phenomenon, which is that over the decade from 2010, life expectancy actually declined for the poorest 10% outside London in the north. It was actually worse. People's health was getting worse over that decade. Now, to come back to your question, do we know why the consequences of deprivation are bigger in the north? No, not exactly. But I think it may relate to the structure of opportunity. If you're growing up in a deprived area in the north, there's less opportunity to get out of that deprived situation than there is in the South. And that means that the government's levelling up ambition was potentially of huge importance. 
Unfortunately, they seem to have forgotten about it. They produced a white paper on levelling up. And then when Rishi Sunak was still Chancellor, he produced a budget that had no money for levelling up. So the ambition embodied in the levelling up white paper was impressive. I wrote an editorial for the BMG praising the ambition and the analysis, but casting questions about whether they were really going to put the money in that was necessary. And I think, unfortunately, that seems to have gone by the wayside. The idea that the two people competing to be prime minister are falling all over themselves to say who could cut taxes more or sooner doesn't augur well for what needs to be done. Mm. Michael, just talk to me about the role of cold specifically in health, because you'll be aware, I'm sure, that there'll be people posting on social media saying that they grew up in the 1960s and there was frost on the windows and your mum or dad would say, just put on an extra jumper. And you know the kind of approach to health that I'm talking about. Just explain why that isn't really adequate to deal with the very serious health consequences of prolonged exposure to cold. This is serious, so I shouldn't trivialise it, but a senior doctor said to me, exactly what you just said. When I grew up, we had ice on the inside of the windows and uh, you can't tell me that damaged my educational uh, development. And I said to him, imagine what you might have achieved if you'd grown up in a warm home. And uh, I'm not sure he liked it. (laughs) Um, The fact that um, older generations survived rigours doesn't mean that those rigours were good for us. Um, People died earlier. They got sick. Um, Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease was the British disease. Uh, Happily, mortality from chronic obstructive pulmonary disease is much, much, much lower now than it was in the past. Now, I'm not saying that was all due to cold. That was due to air pollution and smoking. But my colleague, Professor Simler, who's involved in this report, points out that children's lungs are more likely to be damaged in cold temperatures. And when the indoor temperature is cold and damp, there's more mold, which in turn damages lung development. And that sets a pattern for the rest of the person's life. So indoor cold is bad for lung development. And as I said earlier, it's also bad for mental illness and for educational performance. There is also a disproportionate impact as well on people from minority ethnic groups. It is disproportionate because fuel poverty is disproportionately high in people from minority ethnic groups. So I don't think that minority ethnic groups are necessarily more susceptible to the health effects of cold. They're just more likely to live in cold homes. We are living at a moment of grave national crisis, and it's a crisis that official figures suggest will affect some 15 million people in terms of fuel poverty because of this spike in energy prices. Just spell out what you think the consequences of that will be if it's not addressed. We can think of two types of consequences for health. The first is cold homes. And as we've said, cold homes will damage health through the life course, physical health and mental health. The second type of consequence is it makes it much more challenging to make ends meet. If you've got to spend so much on heating your dwelling, you're going to spend less on food. And if you're trying to balance heating and eating, you're going to spend less on replacing children's shoes or taking them on outings or having children's parties. 
They're not luxuries. Treating children to a decent life is not a luxury. That's something we accept in an advanced, rich country like the United Kingdom. So both types of effect will be major. The direct effect of coal, but also the damaging effect of failure to make ends meet, of difficulty just getting through the day and the week and the month with paying the rent, buying food, all the necessary expenditures that make life habitable and meaningful. At the moment, you estimate that more than 6,000 people a year die from the cold in the UK. If the price spike isn't addressed directly by government action, what do you think that figure will grow to? I can't predict what it'll be, but I'm concerned that it'll rise. And I'm concerned that there will be these other ill effects that I've just been talking about related to diminished incomes and poverty, which will be extreme. Mental illness as well as physical illness, short term and longer term. Your research shows that the installations to improve household energy to at least ban C peaked in 2012. And you say that the insulation has fallen off a cliff since then, fallen something like 90%. So that's obviously one area we could see some dramatic improvement, albeit at one would suggest at significant cost to, to the government, to the taxpayer. What are the other things the government can do directly this winter to address the crisis? Well, not a day goes by without people suggesting different approaches. It's very clear that you can't simply let the price of energy keep rising the way it has. There has to be intervention. And there has to be intervention for a couple of reasons. One is that we've got this dysfunctional energy market. It really just doesn't work properly. As I say, we're paying producers whose cost of production is totally unaffected by the war in Ukraine because it's green energy. But we're paying them more because the total price has gone up. And that makes no sense at all. So we have to intervene in the energy market. You probably saw Torsten Bell from the Resolution Foundation. He said even Winston Churchill raised taxes when it was necessary. And one way to intervene in the energy market is to fix the price. The government can subsidize the in the short term the producers that can't meet that lower price and pay for it out of taxation. Richer people, if we have a properly progressive taxation system, should be paying a higher rate of tax as well as a higher absolute level of taxation. And that can pay for this intervention. So there are a number of suggestions. But the second thing I want to say is that if you target only the poorest, then you miss the fact that more than half of households will be in fuel poverty. So simply linking it to those on benefits, I mean, that would help. In my 2010 report, I elaborated the idea of proportionate universalism. I said that if you focus only on the worst off, you miss those at health disadvantage who aren't in the very poorest group, but are below the top and their health is worse as a consequence. So we need progressive approaches that are universal, but with effort proportionate to need. And for example, if everybody benefited from a price cap, a proper price cap, freezing it, then those in richer households would pay more tax. In a way, they'd give the benefit back. But those in poorer households who don't pay much tax would get the benefit. So you need some sort of approach that deals with the fact that it's not just the people, let's say, on universal credit 
or on pensions who need help, but probably half of all households. And in our previous discussions, Michael, you identified the consequences of austerity, the deleterious effect that has had on health, the way in which health inequality has widened since the introduction of austerity, really starting with the coalition government from 2010 onwards, presumably as well, in conjunction with these specific recommendations regarding the, the current price spike, you would see the rolling back of austerity as being essential to ensuring that we have greater health equality in this country. Absolutely. I've been commenting for a while now that there have been three major challenges to health inequalities. The decade of austerity, the pandemic, and now the cost of living crisis. The cost of living crisis is urgent and it has to be dealt with today, right now. Unfortunately, it's not being dealt with right now, but it has to be. But we need to deal with the consequences of the other two, the decade of austerity and what the pandemic did to inequalities. And it had big effects. So that's why we need to put today's urgent action in the context of the longer term solution to the problem of health inequalities. As you said in the beginning, as I laid out in my 2020, the Marmot Review 10 Years On report. We know what to do to build back fairer. We really, really know what to do. This is not mysterious. I laid out six domains in my original report. Give every child the best start in life, education and lifelong learning. The third is employment and working conditions. The fourth is everybody having at least the minimum income necessary for a healthy life. The fifth, healthy and sustainable places and communities in which to live and work. And we've covered some of that in talking about housing quality. And the sixth is making it possible for people to have a healthier lifestyle, taking a social determinants approach to prevention, to which I've now added two, which is deal with racism, discrimination, and their consequences. And the eighth one is put all of the action for greater health equity in the context of the action needed to deal with the climate crisis. So we know what to do. It takes concerted action by government, by cities and regions, by the health services, by the voluntary and community sector, other public sectors, business. We really know what to do. What I now like to see is people act on that knowledge. Michael, thank you. That's Professor Sir Michael Marmot. Apologies for a little bit of uh, blowing on the line. He's in rather windy conditions, but I'm sure you'll agree that what he's had to say has been very worthwhile indeed. Professor Sir Michael Marmot from UCL, University College London. I'm Adrian Goldberg, and you've been listening to the Byline Times podcast, funded by subscriptions to the Byline Times. Please take out a subscription if you can, because you not only get a brilliant monthly newspaper, you're helping to pay for this podcast too. Get more details at bylinetimes.com. I'll see you again very soon. Cheers for now. Bye-bye.